today we are going to talk about national interest waivers mm -hmm. and you habishek ji have very kindly asked us um, or okayed your consent to post this on social media it will help a lot of people because there are certain elements of national interest waiver that have been evolving and certain that are just not clear so let me first begin with why national interest waiver may not be a suitable option for india mm -hmm. okay people born in india or other countries that are severely backlogged uh, priority dates backlogged this may not be the best option but it has advantages other than just getting you a green card uh, quickly so first of all national interest waiver comes under eb2 category mm -hmm. so you must either have an advanced degree an advanced degree means something that is post bachelor's so sometimes they're not always master's degrees they could be a second bachelor's but if the requirement for the second bachelor's is that you must previously have a bachelor's then it's considered to be an advanced degree Mm -hmm. so either you have advanced degree or you have equivalent experience which is typically 5 plus years 5 years of progressively responsible experience national interest waiver because it is under eb2 category is governed by eb2 priority dates so if the priority date for eb2 is backed up to 2013 then it is even for national interest waiver people so you get your i140 right away but mm. you cannot file the last step of the process until the dates become current however despite being so backed up for india it has advantages number one national interest waiver is not based upon a specific job so that means you become mobile you could you could take your case and you could still take your uh, h1b etc with any employer that you choose and because your i140 is approved you can keep getting extensions beyond 6 years on your h1b with any employer so those are the two big advantages the mobility and the h1b extension okay, okay. what the heck is a national interest waiver it is the waiver of the requirement of a job normally when you file an eb2 you have to have a job mm -hmm. you cannot file an eb2 without having a specific job you go through the perm you have a job software developer uh, systems engineer civil engineer all these jobs you got to have a specific employer national interest waiver says no no we'll waive that because you are so important for us so then the question is what makes you so important number 1 the work that you plan to do it's future job the work that mm -hmm. you plan to do when you get the green card will be of national importance in the interest of united states that begs the question how vast does the scale of the work have to be in other words um do i have to be like the president that i have to do take huge decisions in order to influence the whole country the answer is not quite um this is where one of the fuzzy areas where the policy that the us uh uscis has announced says look we don't look at the geographical impact only sometimes you can have you can be working in an area that's important to the government uh even though your work is local so i'll give you an example of a case we won uh, recently mm -hmm. a scientist working for a ivy league university uh her boss asked us to file a national interest waiver for her because she was born in a country other than india she had a phd and she was working in i remember if i remember correctly um something to do with the um, it's either immunotherapy autoimmune diseases autoimmune diseases okay so look at the case she is working for a university that means her research is available to the whole world and she is working in an area where we have a lot of diseases increasing incidence of autoimmune diseases she's only working for one university she's not working for the whole country but the work is impacting the whole country so uh, her niw was granted without even an rfe no questions asked she had a phd so the first issue was what she's going to work 
work on has national importance. We have done a series of cases in energy also, people who are working in the energy area. Okay, We just finished a case um, for a local university in, here in Washington, DC, where the person was uh, teaching design thinking, but he had some remarkable ideas. Okay, so national impact is one part of the national interest waiver. How about environment? So I have a, I had a case a couple of years ago where this was an architect who was working in uh, green buildings. Okay. Uh, we were able to get his case approved again quite easily because one, he worked for uh, making buildings for state governments through his employer, of course. So he had made buildings for a bunch of state governments, different states. We were able to show that at least three or four states he has gone and done his green building work. You don't have to be unique. It doesn't have, you have, don't have to be the only person in the world who can do it. You just have to have work that is helping the government, helping the United States, not the government. Okay. So first point. Second point is you are, um, there's interest in the United States in your work. Now, what does that mean? So that brings us to two points. Point one is you could have a future project in mind. For example, Many, many years ago, we had a guy who had developed a very interestingly edible packing for fast food. So first you eat the chips, then you eat the packet. Okay. So even though he had no job in this country, he had nothing in this country, uh, but he had the patent to that technology. And a bunch of US companies had given him memorandums of um, interest that if you start this in, in, in USA, we will want to be a part of the, the, the project. So he got his green card. He was sitting outside USA. A couple of companies said, we are interested in the project. That means there's interest in the United States. What about the scientist for the Ivy League University? She already had a job. The fact that you have a job shows there is interest in your work in the United States. At least that's what we argue. Okay. So again, uh, Going back to what we first discussed, national importance, interest in the United States. It can be a current job or a future job. Third thing is, and this is the easy one, you are well positioned to fill the job. That means you can do the work. Of course you can do the work. Okay, that's never, that's never been a major issue. The last one is a legal rather than um, um, a, a technical issue. It's a, it's a legal issue that on the one hand, we have the interest, an interest in protecting the US workforce by not letting in ordinary people. You should hire a U US worker. Why should we let you hire um, a non-US worker? On the other, it is to our best interest in the United States to bring in the best qualified people for certain jobs. So there's a balancing test. And that test, basically, it's more of a legal issue than a technical issue. Once again, if your work is of national importance, this one is relatively easy to prove. Okay, so that's what a national interest waiver looks like. Four things, there is work of national importance, intrinsically national importance. Uh, two, the person, uh, or you can prove that there's interest in the United States in your work. Three, you're well qualified to do the job, never an issue. And four, the legal argument about why Labor search should not be required. Any questions? Go ahead, please. No, I think I got the uh, summary. Yeah, like why would I qualify for a NIW? Like those are the four basic conditions. Yeah. 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 So uh, we had budgeted thirty minutes for this, but I don't think it's it's going to take thirty minutes because yeah. this is a lot easier to define and describe than an EB one A or EB one B, where you have a lot of criteria. This has basically really two criteria. Uh, one, is this nationally important? Two, is their interest? Rest all is pretty much simple stuff. So uh, <clears throat> coming to national interest, like uh, let's say someone who is working in the technology field and has a interest in going uh, to the cybersecurity domain, which is right now is a like a national problem for 
almost all countries, especially mm -hmm. after COVID, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say I am joining a company uh, which is part of the National Cyber Security Alliance, which was formed uh, as recent as last year. Mm -hmm. So can I qualify to be a NIW candidate? If I my, think, yeah, I think so. I think so. So, so for example, uh, in the energy area, I'll tell you a case that didn't go through and a case that did go through. Okay. There was a case, and I don't remember if we were doing it as an EB1A or as a national interest waiver. Uh, I think it was a national interest waiver. So in this case, no, no, this was, sorry, uh, I take it back. This was an EB1A. Mm -hmm. uh, but here was, here was the problem, and this is kind of a similar issue. So this gentleman was a civil engineer who, um, actually a ge geological engineer, because he had used an array of sensors to create um, a sensor mechanism which could predict earthquakes and seismic activity very accurately and far ahead of time than the current technology. But this technology was uh, basically locked into a particular company. They, hold, they held the patent to it. Mm -hmm. So the NIW was denied because they said, well, there is always, there's already this sensor technology there and the work that you are doing is not going to be deployed generally. Mm -hmm. uh, it is going to be confined to this one particular company. Uh, I think that decision, uh, if it was in the, it is not, this is for EB1A, but if this kind of a decision had happened in an NIW, I think it would be incorrect. Why? Because the focus should be on the seismic activity, not who owns the patent. So when you protect a population from seismic activity, who cares where the instrumentation comes from? Mm -hmm. It's his work that has helped protect these people. So that's where the difference is. Taking that same example to cybersecurity. Okay. So there is no doubt that cybersecurity is a matter of intrinsic national interest. Mm -hmm. No doubt about that. Okay. When you are a when you are a part or your employer is a part of a conglomerate that is dedicated to protecting our cyber borders, I think a case can be made that your work is in the national interest. And that becomes even better if we can show uh, that's not required by national interest waiver criteria, but it helps that what you are doing is perhaps at the cutting edge of the cybersecurity work. Yeah, but may not be the immediate work that I'll be doing, but that's the Roger. interest in future, yeah. It can be work in the future, as long as we can prove that you have that project. If you were a businessman, I would have to provide a business plan. Where is the money coming from? How would you hire people? What would you do? So it has to be something more than just your word. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have, for example, a job offer letter or an employer that says, listen, the moment you get a green card, we'll hire you or we plan to hire you. Okay, mm -hmm. so that could help uh, having a project or a job offer in hand for after you get your green card. Yeah, so basically what you were saying, even with the NIW, let's say best case if the NIW is approved uh, with a potential good case, uh, the only time I am saving is the 140 approval. Rest, I am in the queue and waiting for the priority date, right? You are actually not saving any time. <laughs> okay. Because okay. a firm, see, remember, think about it. You go to the deli shop to get a sandwich. They have a token system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the token system, your number is 93. That's what a priority date is. Your number is 93. So you can only get your sandwich when number 93 is called, yeah. right? So you're the number 93rd third person in the line. Whether you go for a walk, go for a jog, go swimming, get your car repaired, whatever you do, you're not going to get called until your number comes. Correct. Correct. It's the same for priority dates. So if you file a perm, the day you file your perm application, your priority date is established. The, way, the day your I-140 gets approved, your priority date becomes final. Uh, if you happen to be waiting 
for priority dates to become current, whether you went through PERM or you went through NIW, it's the same thing. But isn't it, I mean, it's just what I heard, it may not be correct 100%, that uh, for the NIW, uh, you actually skip the labor step, like that's, that's waived? Yeah. I was, yeah, I was going to make that point that the only time you have saved is the time it took to wait for and file PUM, which is about a year. Okay, yeah. what does that do? It gives you an earlier priority date. Mm -hmm. So if you went through PUM, your priority date would have arrived maybe a year, year and a half later. So mm -hmm. that's the time you save. But is it a huge saving of time? Probably not. But is one year a big saving? If you think so, yes, it is. But also remember, this is a lot more uncertain than a POM application. POM applications, we can tell when we are going to win and when we are not going to win. And NWs, you can never predict. It's ultimately the call of the officer who's looking at the case. OK. So Rajivji, right now, my situation is uh, just two days back, my OPT got approved. And uh, my future employer, who I'm joining, joining in uh, May, uh, is planning for a H1B uh, like in this lottery, like which, starts, which started yesterday, basically. Yes. So, Let's say if it get picked up, I get a H1. I mean, I will do a change of status to a H1, and possibly that employer uh, might also file a H1. I mean, a green card from from their side. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't get picked up, like uh, what would be your best suggestion? Like, should I wait for the next lottery, or should I uh, go with a NIW with this story that I just said? These are two different things, right? Right. Because because you have made the bad decision to be born in India, now you are stuck with India, okay? Yeah. So if you were born in Armenia, we could have gotten your green card probably within a year, year and a half, two years at the most, right? Right. Now, remember, there are two different um, considerations here. One is, how do I work tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And two, how do I get my green card? These are two different things. How do I work tomorrow is called basically by your H-1B or OPT, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, if you apply for an NIW, that's not going to help you tomorrow. That's going to help you in 15 years when you get your green card. Mm. Or 10 years, whatever the time is. So, what you need to do is worry about both. What do I do about tomorrow? And what do I do about my green card? So, tomorrow, you could go back to school, get, get more education, curricular practical training. Um, remember, you want to enhance your career and not just keep getting CPTs. So if you go back to school, get something that's going to help your career so that we can, if ever questioned, although this is legal, uh, we can argue that this was an enhancement of your career. Okay. For example, if you had a degree, let's say in uh, um, computer engineering, and now you're getting a degree in um, machine learning with a focus on machine learning, artificial intelligence, or big data and uh, data analytics. So th those things, those things are advancing your career, uh, giving you a sub-specialization with your own, within your own specialization. So that's what you would have to do. Uh, filing a sub and then NIW is not a substitute for an H-1B for people other than those whose um, countries are backlogged. So if your country is not backlogged, then of course NIW is a good option. Okay, but isn't it like? Like if if uh, if an NIW application goes through approved, um, the amount of time I set for the labor, let's say one year, and then uh, so let's say in a normal EB2 scenario, if it takes like two or three years to reach that stage to get the visa, which which can be yeah. extended in oh, three years interval, I, yeah. Your point is one year of calendar time mm -hmm. could translate to three, four, five, six years of waiting time. Correct. Right? Because Correct. the dates don't move month to month. Dates move, you know, six months for one month advancement in, in, in priority dates. So yes, that's a valid point. But balance that against the point that NIW is not a guarantee. You can never predict True. it's going to work or not. But certainly worth a try. Um, if if, you're, if you, your job involves nationally sensitive areas and meets the criteria, I would definitely do it. No question about it. And what if, if it is denied, then will it have any future uh, ramification? Like in my future, any green card application or any, nothing like no. that? You can okay. file an NIW a thousand times or more if you want. 
Okay. You can also file NIW plus any other green card category a thousand times if you want. The only category I have a problem with is if you file an NIW and for the same job file a POM application. Mm -hmm. This could be a problem because one of my arguments is that, well, this job should not be made to go through POM because then all of a sudden it's a self-denying um, filing. So I that's one thing I would avoid. Uh, other than that, yes, it's a good idea. Um, the downside for any green card is simply this. If you have exhibited immigrant intent, it might be difficult to get those visas where non-immigrant intent is required, such as a future student visa. Mm -hmm. But if you don't need those, then there is zero uh, loss other than the loss of money in filing the application. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, we are just six minutes left. So, standing at this juncture, like, take your time. Uh, you're the last call of the day for me. I can take Okay. My time. Okay. So, standing at this moment, right, uh, when the OPT is approved and, uh, and a H1 is being filed, like, what do you suggest? Like, should I wait and see uh, it gets picked up and then make my next move? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What I want you to do is um, because, see, until you've got your immediate future secured, you mm -hmm. can't prepare for the distant future. Okay. Correct. So if I know that I have my H-1B selection, I would immediately move to file the NIW. Okay. Okay. But if I'm okay. not selected for the lottery, I have to decide, am I going to have to go get a student visa again? Uh, mm -hmm. Per chance? What am I going to do with my future? When should I time my NIW? So I personally think that waiting... Mm -hmm. Two more weeks or three more weeks is not going to kill your case. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And other thing is, uh, I had a previous H-1B with a different employer. And I am left with around two months of physical stay in U.S. in that petition. Okay. So I have not completed the full six years. So, like, is it going to help in any? No help, right? I mean, yeah, I was thinking that, yeah. Well, you have two options, uh, either be exempted from lottery with two months, for two months of H-1B, mm -hmm. or if you have been outside USA for one year after the H-1B, just mm -hmm. reset the H-1B clock to six years and apply through the lottery. Oh, yeah. I was out of uh, US uh, for more than that, like after that uh, stay. Okay. So that's why you have to go through the lottery. You want six years. You don't want two months. You Correct. can get two so, months right so now that... you. So that two months is basically waste. Like there is no nothing I can get now out of that. Write it off. Okay, cool. Uh, and another question I have is, uh, let's say someone is working like me in, in student visa. And mm -hmm. then uh, he or she has a job offer, but that person, that company does not sponsor visa. Can that candidate sponsor himself? Like let's say through you cannot, yeah. right? Because that, that company has to be the petitioner. H-1B, and that's an important point for NIW also. For H-1B and palm-based green cards, it's always the company that sponsors you. Mm. But for NIW, it can be you. It can also be the company. But why would you? You should always do it for yourself. Right. And so someone uh, graduating with a supply chain major, let's say MBA in supply chain, uh, do you think it can qualify for NIW? See, it's not so much what your qualifications are. Remember, that was point number three in our discussion. Point one mm -hmm. was you are going to work in the in an area which is of in, interest to the national United interest. States. Yeah, yeah. Number two, there is interest in your work in the United States. There are people willing mm -hmm. to hire you or willing to, and uh, so the the kind of work you'd be doing is this is where the balancing act comes has to be something more than just working for a company. Right. Okay. So I'll give you an example. So let's say you get a job in supply chain and you're not, you're not being hired by the company to just work on their own supply chain, but rather to work with the federal government to straighten out some of their, you know, some of their work. Mm -hmm. okay. Now that seems more to be a national interest waiver case than working for a single company. Because here you are hel helping the federal government, even though you're doing it through your employer. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll give you another interesting uh, tidbit before um, I forget this also. Uh, there, is a, there is a brand of national interest waiver that is at the request of a federal government agency. 
Okay. So if a federal government agency writes four lines, uh, you know, we need this particular gentleman to help with our war effort. Mm -hmm. Please give a green card based upon national interest. Waiver. That's it. Okay. But who should write that letter in the agency? Mm -hmm. The federal agency. Can the letter be from a frontline manager? And the answer is no. Normally, such letters should come from a from an officer high enough uh, or qualified enough to speak for the whole agency. Okay, so it's a pretty high high barrier. So there's also that. But let's say you were working in supply chain for the government, um, you could get letters from the frontline managers to show that what you're doing is helping the government. It won't qualify for that single letter exception, but it yeah. would qualify as showing that your work has merit. So uh, on the similar line, so uh, someone working in a national laboratory, let's say or We've Los Alamos. Case We've done cases. Yeah, Los Alamos. Let's say he yeah. or she is working in the weapon systems, uh, doing something definitely, in Los Alamos. Definitely, these cases okay. are approvable. approvable. We have done cases in uh, energy mm -hmm. for okay. national labs. Yeah. I see. So I think uh, I got good amount of information from you today. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Rajivji. My pleasure. Uh, let me absorb these and let me wait for the lottery to happen. Let's see if I'm lucky enough to get picked up. But definitely I will be in touch with you. Um, yes. Even if it is not picked up, then what's the next step, basically? Absolutely. Um, all right. We're going to post this on YouTube, etc., all the social media. So if um, uh, you know people have any questions, they can reach out to me. Um, yeah. I'm trying to see. If there's anything last minute, no. So national interest waiver is a great option for people not born in India. Let's put it like that. <laughs> or people yeah, yeah. married to people who are not born in India. Because you can yeah. be cross charge. Okay. Yeah. 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 So good talking right. to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye.